knowing that created a mindset in me so that, in fact, I wasn't afraid as we went down the stairs. I knew where to go and it was absolute knowledge. And there's a lot to be said for knowledge is power. There were a couple of times that people started to lose it. In fact, at one point, David Frank, my colleague that I mentioned earlier said, Mike, we're gonna die. We're not gonna make it out of here. Hello and welcome to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I'm Will Polston. This is episode number 153. And in this episode, I'm joined by Mike Hinson. Blind since birth, Michael Hinson was born to sighted parents who raised him with a can-do attitude. Always a high achiever, Michael learned how to ride a bike and was able to do advanced maths in his head. He received a master's degree in physics and a secondary teaching credential. Michael worked for high-tech companies in management until September 11th, 2001, when he and his guide dog, Rizal, escaped from the 78th floor of Tower One in the World Trade Centers. Thrust into the international limelight, Michael began to share lessons of trust, courage, and teamwork based on this experience. Mike is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Thunderdog, selling over 2.5 million copies, and his second book, Running With Rizal, a story for our youth. An international public speaker, Mike delivers inspiring and thought-provoking messages to the world's elite, including President George W. Bush, and has appeared on hundreds of TV and radio programs, including Larry King. In this episode, we're going to be talking about being blind and escaping from the 78th floor of the Twin Towers on 9-11. So, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. So, Mike, you are uh, the very first speaker that I've had on the podcast uh, that is blind so i'm really looking forward to our conversation because i've seen some of your 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 talks i've seen some of your interviews but i I just wanted to make sure that you know that you've got that that world first of all your achievements and accomplishments that you've had in life um i'm sure that is one to go uh right up there at the top with the best of them now being the 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 very first blind guest on the uh the make it happen with will polson podcast well thank you i'm honored to be here and be a part of this So you have got a a very unique story, and I think that it's fair to say that some of the things that you've gone through in your life are are truly inspirational, which I'm really looking forward to to getting stuck into on this conversation. I'm already saying that you were blind from birth, but you were brought up by sighted parents, and they installed a very much a can-do attitude into your life. My parents were told when it was discovered I was blind at about four months of age, they were told that they should send me off to a home because no blind child could ever grow up and be any kind of a useful member of society. Um, They were told that by the doctors who decided and discovered that I was blind. And, And so my parents, though, said, no, you're wrong. He can do anything he wants to do. We're going to bring him up with uh, an attitude that says he can do whatever he chooses to. And they didn't really go out of their way to treat me different, if you will. I mean, by definition, there were differences because I couldn't see. And so I had to learn to do things in a different way, such as um, learning to read Braille and things like that. But it was just sort of the natural thing for them to have me do that. They were very unusual in that regard, because even today, most parents of blind children shelter their kids. They believe that blind children can't really go and do the things that other people can do. And the reality is we can do most of the same things that everyone else can do, but we may do them in different ways. I even interviewed on my podcast, Unstoppable Mindset, someone who was blind and played second base for a baseball team. And there are ways that he did that. And the team allowed for the the differences to make that happen but he was competitive um even so not unusually so not f- having been shown favoritism but rather the team accommodated the fact that he had to do some things in a different way and it became the natural course of of things And all the fans, all the parents of the other uh, players on the Little League team and the high school teams and so on. And I think, if I recall right, even into a college team, accepted it in stride. And that's the way it really ought to be. The fact is, 
every person on this planet has a disability. And for most of you, it's the fact that you're a light dependent. You need light in order to function. I was reading an article yesterday about in America, the fact that there has been an extremely significant increase in the number of pedestrian deaths at night. And what the article basically said was it has a lot to do with the fact that there is dark and uh, people don't deal with it. Well, it's not just pedestrian deaths, but in general, people don't understand that light dependence or being able to function um, only in the light is not the way that necessarily we should do things. And the fact is that um, light dependence or being sighted is just as much a disability as being blind. And I won't mm -hmm. say unsighted, I won't say visually impaired, that's a horrible term, but rather blind or low vision. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason is, is because it just means we're gonna do things in a different way. So disability doesn't mean a lack of ability, disability means it's a characteristic. It is something that we all have and it manifests in different ways. And as I said, for most people, it's light dependence. Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb so you all can see in the dark and that's okay. We have no problem with you seeing in the dark, but don't condemn us just because we don't. Mm. And my parents really, whether they verbalized or not, brought me up with that kind of an attitude. And I believe it's an appropriate attitude. Yeah. I mean, the, it's the, the famous saying, isn't it? Henry Ford uh, said, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. But obviously, you're right. in your instance, it's um, very much of whether you think you're ca whether you think your son can or whether you think your son can't. You're, you're right. And and it's the, uh, the 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 basis of, I suppose, what I'm really interested to know is that, like you said, from a very young age, four months old, you realize that this was the case or your parents found out this was the case. How much of that um, way of thinking that they installed into you, do you think drove you? Because I'm sure at times there were other people as you grew up that thought that you couldn't do things. But how much of that belief that they installed into you did, did you ever get swayed when other people said you couldn't do things or was it always this unwavering belief that your parents installed into you that you could do anything that you you kind of wanted regardless of being blind i think mostly i really went with what my parents in, instilled in me the you know the bottom line really is that i grew up for well let's take my up through high school um there were times that my parents were told by teachers or um, a school to send me to a school for the blind. And I have heard some of those fights and they got pretty loud, but my parents said, no, he's going to go to a regular school. Now, could I have done okay in a school for the blind at the time in the 1950s and even into the early sixties, it would have been a, a, a place to go where I could have learned things and been around other blind kids more than I was but at the same time, my parents said he needs to really grow up to go to school like everyone else does. Well, for a while, there were problems with that because I didn't get books in Braille until I was in the fourth grade. I had learned Braille in kindergarten in Chicago where I was born. But after kindergarten, uh, my parents relocated to Southern California and then for first through third grade, well, actually kindergarten through third grade, because I um, moved when I was five. And <clears throat> even though I had spent a year in kindergarten in Chicago, uh, in California, you had to do kindergarten when you were five. So I got a second year of kindergarten. It was kind of boring, but I didn't think about it. I just listened and I learned all I could and went into first, second and third grade. And there weren't books in Braille for me at that time because there were just no facilities to know how to get them. But between third and fourth grade, a teacher was hired specifically because there were more blind and low vision kids in the area where we lived. And so then I started to get books in Braille and had to relearn Braille and go forward from there. But there were times that teachers or principals um, did fight with my parents. And probably the biggest and most significant one was when I was in the first year of high school. Um, I had gotten a guide dog at the age of 14 between uh, the uh, junior high and high school. So that summer in July of 1964, I went to get a guide dog. I was allowed by the school um, to, to come in two years before mostly uh, children could go get a guide dog. 
And in March of 1965, the vice principal, who we had actually made friends with at my school, called me in and he said, we have a problem. The superintendent has learned that you ride to school with your guide dog. And he has said, you can't do that because we have a rule that says no live animals are allowed on a school bus. Mm. And my, um, my reaction was, well, the superintendent's wrong because there is a law in the state of California, which I learned about from the guide dog school when I was there. Um, there was a law that said it was a felony to deny a blind person the right to take a guide dog on any public conveyance and anywhere else that people could go. And it ended up being a battle before the school board. My, my father went and researched, learned all the laws. And my father had an eighth grade education, but he was also a man who was the supervisor of an advanced equipment lab at Edwards Air Force Base working in the space programs and so on. So he went and learned the laws. And when he did that, we went to the board meeting and the superintendent, who really was kind of a bully, got up first and he said, well, this is really simple. We have a rule, no live animals on the bus. And so he can't take his dog on the bus. And um, my dad got up and he said, well, you know, here's the, the real deal. Section 643.5 of the Penal Code of the State of California says that a blind person could take a guide dog on any public conveyance into any public place and on any common carriers. And according to Black's Law Dictionary, a school bus is a common carrier. And um, so if you don't let my son take his guide dog on the school bus, um, you're going to be eligible for a, a one year stay in the penitentiary and a thousand dollar penal uh, fine. And the superintendent got up and he said to the chair of the board, is this guy right? Well, the chair was a lawyer and also had presided at my star Boy Scout Court of Honors. So we knew each other. And when the superintendent said that, the uh, chair of the board said, yep. Even so, the board voted three to two to support the superintendent's position and keep me off the bus. And then what my father did was wrote to the governor of the state of California. And I don't know what happened, but I do know that one day suddenly the superintendent was summoned to Sacramento and the next week I was back on the bus. Mm. So with all, to go back to your question, the reason for telling that story is it's kind of hard to let anything else overwhelm me when clearly watching my father, clearly seeing all the things that happened and all the ways that they defended me, um, it was and is really hard to let someone come along and say, you can't do stuff and, mm. and really say uh, you're blind. So you're just not as good as the rest of us. Mm. So the reality is overall, no, my parents really had uh, the, the greatest influence on me in in so many ways. And that still is true today. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I can see that's the case. And of, of course, throughout life you've had to deal with these sort of challenges and I'm sure you've got dozens of examples of these types of situations however for, for anybody that's over the age of I would say about 25 or 26 as of the point of listening to this in in 2023 pretty much every single person can place themselves of where they were on September sure. the 11th 2001 sure and where were you Mike? I was on the 78th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. Um, I was very fortunate. Um, the unemployment rate among employable blind people traditionally ranges around the world in most um, modern countries. The unemployment rate is near 70%. And it's not because blind people can't work. It's because other people think blind people can't work. And that's mm. really the problem that we face. And so the result is that I um, was very fortunate because out of college, I got a job and that led to other jobs and I was able to be employed. But I never forget that I was very fortunate compared to most people. And the result is that I honor that by continuing to be an advocate in battle, if you will, as people do find themselves in employment issues. So for me, um, I got a job in 1999 to open an office for a Fortune 500 company in New York. And we opened that office 
on the 78th floor of Tower One of the World Trade Center. And the office finally opened, was all set up on August 1st of 2000. Well, the next year we were gonna do some training programs to teach our reseller partners how to sell our products. And wouldn't you know what the day we chose was September 11th, 2001. So I was in the office wow. along with my fifth guide dog, Roselle, a colleague from our corporate office, David Frank, uh, was in, and we had some early guest arrivals from the distributor for us, who was the, the organization that actually asked us to set up the training, a company called Ingram Micro. And at 8.46 in the morning, we heard a muffled explosion, and then literally, if you can imagine it, the building started to tip. Now, what people don't understand is that tall buildings like that are really springs. They have expansion joints. They're made to flex in windstorms and so on, because it does happen. I was in my office many times over the, the, the year and a month that I was there, and I could feel the building swaying because the wind was blowing it, and they're made to do that. Um, and in fact, if the building was struck by an airplane and it had just been the airplane hitting the building, it wouldn't have collapsed. But the fact that it had 26,000 pounds of jet fuel is a different story. Mm. And the result is that that destroyed the infrastructure of the building. But what, what happened is that the building swayed. David and I were in my office. We had guests in our conference room. And they were eating an early breakfast that we had provided. Um, and when the building was moving, we had no idea what happened. Now, people always say to me, of course, well, you didn't know because you couldn't see it. The last time I checked, as I tell people, Superman and X-ray vision are fiction. The fact is, being on the 78th floor on the south side of the building and the airplane hitting the building roughly on the 96th floor on the north side, nobody saw it. None mm. of us knew what happened. Blindness had nothing to do with it. Um, people always try to go back to, well, it's because you couldn't see. Well, it's not because I couldn't see, because nobody knew. All mm. the way down in the stairwell, walking down, which is what we had to do to get out, because um, David even saw fire when the building stopped moving. David looked out the window and there was fire. The bottom line is we, um, we knew there was fire, but we didn't know what caused it. But as we were going down the stairs, I smelled an odor and it took me about three or four floors to realize I was smelling the fumes from burning jet fuel, that is kerosene. And what um, we decided was an airplane must have hit the building, but we had no clue as to why. And it, and I say we, I mean, it's the hundreds and uh, maybe thousands of people on the stairwell all around us who came in from our side of the building. And then none of them had any idea what happened. We assumed an airplane hit because we smelled the fuel, but that was it. And we went down the stairs. Um, it was reasonably calm. There were a couple of times that people started to lose it. In fact, at one point, David, Frank, my colleague that I mentioned earlier, said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. Well, I have a master's degree in physics and a secondary teaching credential. And today, I travel and speak all over the world, not only telling my story, but talking about teamwork and trust and leadership. And one of the things that... Um, I love to tell people is when I describe how David said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. I said, I used my best teacher's voice that I learned in that secret class voice 101, how to yell at students. <laughs> and I said, stop it, David. If Rosella and I can go down these stairs, so can you. And he wow. told me that that brought him out of his funk, which is what I intended. What David then did, and I think it's important to talk about it, is that he said, I'm going to walk, I, I need to get my mind off of what's going on. I'm going to walk a floor below you and just shout up to you what I see on the stairs. Did I need David to do that? No, <clears throat> but it made him feel better. So we did it. And he walked down the stairs and suddenly I hear, Hey, Mike, I'm on the 48th floor. All is good here. And then a floor later as I'm going down, Hey, Mike, I'm on the 47th floor. Meanwhile, I'm up a floor saying to my guide dog, Roselle, what a good dog. Keep going. What a good girl. Because I needed her to know that I'm calm and I'm okay and that she doesn't need to fear. She and I feed off each other. We're a team. A guide dog's job is to guide and make sure we walk safely. My job is to know where to go and how to get there and direct the dog. 
And if I start being afraid, then she's going to become fearful. So I needed to stay focused for her. But in addition to that, we have David going, Mike, I'm on the 46th floor. All's good here. The reason I think it's so important is because in reality, when David was shouting up to me, anyone in the sound of his voice, which could have been hundreds or thousands of people below him, above him, and everywhere else, knew that somewhere on the stairs, somebody was okay. And he had to have helped keep so many people calm and focused as we went down the stairs, which was cool. So we made it down the stairs and we got outside. But to talk about not being afraid, one of the things that I did when I started working in the World Trade Center was that I spent time doing two things. One, walking around the World Trade Center, learning where everything was. On the first floor between the towers was a shopping mall. And I learned what the where the kiosks were in, in there and what they were and all that, made friends with people, learned where all the major offices were around the World Trade Center for customers that we might visit. I talked to the Port Authority security people, the police, the fire people, and so on, and learned everything I could about the complex, including what to do in the case of an emergency, because I ran that office. And I had to be the one to know what to do. I mean, how would it look if uh, we decided that we wanted to go to lunch after some customers were coming up to visit us. And um, I said, well, I'm blind. I don't know how to get anywhere. And somebody has to leave me and we go to lunch. And then two hours later, we're going to come back up and negotiate a multi-million dollar contract. Is that the image I want to project? Or do I want to project an image that says, oh, you want to go to lunch? What kind of food? Okay, let me take you and lead the way, which is what anyone else would do. So I needed to do the things that the leader of an office would do. The difference is I needed to know the stuff. I don't read signs. The bottom line of all that is, and it's something that I talk about when I speak, knowing that created a mindset in me so that, in fact, I wasn't afraid as we went down the stairs. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew what to do in an emergency. I knew where to go. And it was absolute knowledge. And there's a lot to be said for knowledge is power. So the bottom line for me is, I knew all of that. I didn't have any real fears. Oh, I was afraid, but nothing that overwhelmed me because I knew what to do in an emergency. And hey, if the building collapsed all around us, well, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. It wouldn't have mattered anyway, right? Mm. So here we are. Um, so we went downstairs and got out. And then we were very close to Tower 2 when it collapsed, when everybody then had to run. And I did as well. And uh, we ended up with David in a subway station where we stayed for a while and then we came out and discovered that Tower 2 indeed had collapsed. Um, and it was now about, oh, um, probably about 10.15 because Tower 2 collapsed at what, 10.04. We got out of the building at 9.45. Uh, so it was about an hour from the time the plane hit until we got out. And then it was another... 17 or 18 minutes before Tower 2 collapsed, but we were very close to it. And in fact, David has some pictures of the tower just before it collapsed. And so we, um, but we did run and we got away. We were in a subway station and a police officer came and said, you need to leave now. The air is clear up above. And we went up and discovered that Tower 2 had collapsed. We continued to walk away from the area and then Tower 1 collapsed. And it was only after Tower 1 collapsed that I was able to call my wife and get through to her. And she's the one who told us how two aircraft had been crashed deliberately into the towers, one into the Pentagon and a fourth was missing over Pennsylvania. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And I obviously that that moment for, well, everybody in the world. I mean, I, I remember specifically where I was in that moment. I, I mean, I was how old was I at the time? I think 11 or 12 at the time. Mm. And I remember coming home from school and, and clicking every single news channel. So obviously here in the UK, we're, yeah. we're about five hours ahead of New York. So it, it right. was literally sort of probably, I'd, I would have got home not long after three 30, come up to four o'clock. So it would have only been sort of half an hour after the, um, the first the, hour, the first, first hour had collapsed. And the, 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 the process of all of that and everything that was going on was there ever a point in your time was there ever a point when you were going down i appreciate obviously you said mentioned you could smell the, the the jet fuel but was there ever a point in your time where you thought i might not get out of this 
when you were walking down the 78 flights of stairs or well, more flights, but 78 floors worth of stairs. Very frankly, there wasn't time to think that. Um, mm. No, I didn't feel that. I think uh, obviously David did, but for me, I was busy keeping Roselle focused, keeping me focused, keeping us working together. And also my mindset was there's nothing I can do about all of that anyway. So I need mm. to do what I need to do. So no, um, I never even thought about, gee, what if I don't make it out of here? Um, uh, and I didn't even think about what if I do make it out of here? It was more a matter of I'm living in the moment, which is yeah. really the best thing to do. You can only deal with what you can deal with. Mm. And so really living in the moment made the, and does make the most sense in that kind of a situation because uh, you can only deal with the circumstances that you're facing. Yeah, We didn't have any control over the World Trade Center being attacked. And I'm not sure that we could have caught it. Um, I know that there's all the discussions about different agencies who knew this and that, and they didn't communicate, but I've not heard anything that really convinces me totally that if we had collaborated totally and were better at doing it, um, that we could have caught the uh, this event before it happened. Maybe we could have. But the bottom line is, we didn't have control over what happened on September 11th. What we do have control over is how we deal with it. And mm. for me, the dealing with it in the moment was encouraging Roselle, my guide dog, keeping me focused and having this mindset of not being afraid or being able to control fear and using it to keep me more alert, which is really what it's about. Yeah. I mean, there's two things that I take from what you said. I mean, the first thing, which was sort of in, in my word is preparation, the way you prepared beforehand, like you said, the example of knowing where all the restaurants were, knowing what could happen, knowing what was capable and, uh, and, and putting yourself in that very boss, best possible position for per certain scenarios. So that's the first thing. And as you've just said, deal with what you can deal with, you know, focus right. on what you can focus, control the controllables and putting yourself in that situation. Were there any members of your team that didn't make it out? Oh, everyone made it out. Uh, most of my team was actually out working that day. I didn't want my salespeople in the office when we were going to be doing the training. They need to go out and sell and support their manager and, and, and keep him fed. I love to say that, but yeah. the bottom line is that um, they were all there. I had one employee, um, my best sales guy ever, who was supposed to be at Cantor Fitzgerald for an appointment at 10 that morning. And in fact, he was on one of the trains into the World Trade Center and it had just gotten into the lobby or actually not to, well, to the underground area where the station was as Tower 2 was hit. And he said, we felt a jolt and uh, the ground shook and the, the engineer of the train shouted on the PA system, don't anybody leave? And they literally went right around and came back out and went to back to New Jersey. And he was the closest to um, having something happen to him. But no, my people made it out. Of course, we knew people who didn't. Um, I don't think there is anyone who worked in there who wouldn't have known someone. Yeah. But we, we, did, uh, we did okay. And, um, and obviously helped a lot of other people that day as um as things were occurring yeah yeah no i can i can completely get that and you you said about a moment ago about how how you deal with things you know so obviously that that is to this day one of the the sort of iconic moments of of, of sort of human civilization in terms of kind of yeah. what went on and, and what happened there so in subsequent days weeks months years and and even now, what twenty two years on? Twenty two years later, yeah. How how did you and have you gone on to deal with that specific moment? It's interesting. Um, I I still just have such a different mindset. I can't imagine anybody valuing human life so little that those 19 people did what they did with those four airplanes. Mm -hmm. And even in the, the wars and the things that we have today. Um, and I know we're dealing with the Israel Hamas war. Mm. And the, the fact is, and, and I'm hearing a lot about protests and people think that Israel shouldn't be so indiscriminate. 
Um, I, I understand that. I appreciate that. But, you know, when they talk about the rules of war, the last time I checked, there really aren't rules of war, especially when you're dealing with a group of people who don't value hum human life. Mm. Now, that isn't to say that Israel shouldn't do all it can, but I think Israel is trying to do what it can. And yes, we're losing a lot of people on the, on the Gaza side, but the reality is that we're dealing with a group of people on the terrorist side who don't value human life. And I, I mm. really have a hard time conceptualizing that, but I understand it intellectually. Um, it's just not the way that I think. But for me, um, one of the fortunate things that happened is that the day after September 11th, on the 12th, my wife suggested I should call Guide Dogs for the Blind, where I've gotten all of my guide dogs there in San Rafael, California, and tell them you know, that we got out because several of them had visited us in the World Trade Center over the, the year that we were there. And we helped get them to see the, the center and a tour and all that. And so she said, you really ought to let them know that you made it out. Well, they wrote a story that got us very visible in the media. It led to five interviews on Larry King Live, the first on the 14th of September and other things. And then it led to people starting to uh, reach out to me and say, we'd like to hire you to come and tell your story and to talk about leadership and trust and what we should learn, what lessons we should learn from September 11th. So it was more than just telling a story. Mm -hmm. And and I did all that and it all happened. <clears throat> but the result is that because of all of that occurring, um, the media wanted to talk to me a lot. And my wife and I decided that we would accept doing these interviews because if it would help people move on from September 11th, it would help people learn more about blindness and understand some of the things that you and I have talked about today. And if it would help people learn about guide dogs um, and what they really do as opposed to leading a blind person because guide dogs don't lead, they guide. Like I said, mm. their job is to make sure we walk safe, not to know where to go and how to get there. But anyway, if it would help with all that, then I was glad to do the interviews. Well, the byproduct of that is, you know, they always talk about therapy and how you really should talk about traumatic and challenging things that happen to you. Well, getting literally hundreds of interviews, maybe thousands of interviews, being asked every question imaginable from very intelligent questions to the dumbest questions that you can think of. And I mentioned about how people said, well, you were blind. You didn't know what happened, of course. And learning to talk about all that, that was therapy for me. So mm. I have to admit that the media helped a lot. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Well, talking about the media, I mean, and, and you're touching on Israel, is that you are currently the 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 CVO, um, the Chief Vision Officer of Accessibility, which is actually based in Israel, which helps companies, nonprofits, organizations throughout the world make their websites accessible and inclusive to to people with disabilities. Um, so. I mean, would, would it be be fair to say, I mean, we, we, we hear of the saying, don't we, the, the blind leading the blind, but you are literally the blind leading the sighted, aren't you, in, in that respect, in terms of helping people to be able to, uh, to, to make things more accessible? Well, with accessibility, it's a team, you know, and my job is um, one of the things that they asked me to do was to start the podcast, which I did in August of 2021. And it's a podcast called Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. And it's worded that way because if you ask people who are experts in diversity what diversity is, they'll talk about sexual orientation and gender and race and so on. They don't talk about disabilities. Mm -hmm. So we put inclusion first. I did that um, because accessibility said, we just want a podcast that we can call our own, but we want you to, to decide what it should be. And so um, we put inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected. And the unexpected is mostly what we do. Unexpected basically is talking about anything other than inclusion and diversity. But if you are inclusive, you have to include disabilities. There is no such thing as partially inclusive. You either are or you're not. And if you're not dealing with disabilities, among other things, and of course, my definition, as I pointed out earlier, is that everyone has a disability and we shouldn't be excluding anyone. So you either are or you're not. But the podcast, <clears throat> and I'm always looking for people who want to come on, and we drafted you, as you know, um, is the, the idea behind it is to get people to come on and tell their stories, whatever they are. 
And I've had a lot of fascinating stories over the past two years and three months, um, but stories that they've experienced. And mm. we have literally an hour long conversation with each person. And some people have said, I don't think I have a story to tell. Well, we, we help them discover that they do. And we have a lot of fun doing it. Um, and it comes out every Tuesday and every Friday. Friday, And so um, it's, it's really fun to do. So Accessibility has, has given me the opportunity to do that. I do onboarding and training of staff um, at Accessibility, um, get to have lots of conversations like this about the reality that the internet is a place of business. It is a place that we all use, and it should be as inclusive as everything else. Mm -hmm. And Accessibility does do a lot to help make the internet a lot more inclusive than it otherwise would be. Um, they've, they've done a, a great job with the products and the technologies and the techniques that the three guys who started Accessibility have brought to the market. And Accessibility has become very successful at doing that. Um, there's an office also in New York now, and it's really exciting to see how much of a difference Accessibility is making um, I'm amazed when I go on to the internet and sometimes I'm looking for one thing or another and suddenly I come across a new website and I can tell it's an, a website that Accessibility is part of. And just to see all the, the places that are becoming more inclusive simply because they've chosen to, to accept Accessibility's idea that we all need to make sure that everyone's included in the internet. And that's as good as it gets. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And it's a great mission you're on. Do you know what, actually, as you were just talking there, I just I actually found myself welling up because you said about the sort of everybody has a disability and something that I just completely forget about day to day. Um, and not a lot of people know this, especially the people that are uh, that, that are watching this, is that I actually, um, I'm, I'm a third deaf in my right ear. I've had loads, I think nearly a dozen ear operations on both ears, but one, one. I've had a few serious operations on, on my right ear to the point where now actually it may even be more than a third. When I lay down on a pillow and I'm sort of laying on my side and my good ears in the pillow and, and my, my partner's kind of talking to me, sometimes I can't hear what's being said. Um, mm. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I forget about that day to day. And a lot of people listening to this won't actually know that, but um, yeah, so re really interesting, but look, um, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Mike. You, you're, you're an inspiration. You know, what you've done, your can-do attitude that your parents installed into you has been a a, a blessing um, for, for so many people, of course, for yourself. But the way that you're 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 leading and guiding others in the way that you, you you're doing um and and like you say by having an unstoppable mindset and the way that you've gone on to do things is is truly incredible and I'm, i've got no doubt you're going to continue to do it for many many more years if people want to connect with you find out more about what you're up to where can they connect with you and, and find out more well they can go to michaelhingson.com um m-i-c-h-a-e-l-h-i-n-g-s-o-n.com um we are certainly in places on the Accessibility website, www.accessibility.com, A-C-C-E-S-S-I-B-E.com. And by the way, if anyone goes there, there is a link where they can, if they have a website, they can go to that link and they can do a free audit to see how accessible their website is today and start to learn how to improve it, whether they use Accessibility or something else, people should really understand how inclusive or not their website is. Um, they uh, were on LinkedIn, um, of course, and in you know, a number of places like that. Um, and um, I'm assuming you'll be able to put some links up. I would, would also tell people, we talked about not being afraid um, during the whole event with the World Trend Trade Center. And um, one of the things that I realized during the pandemic was that while I had talked about not being afraid, I wasn't ever teaching people how to learn to control their fear, or as I say, not be blinded by fear. <clears throat> we just finished a book that will be out next year. Tyndale Publishing is the publisher of it. And the title of the book is Live Like a Guide Dog, True Stories of a, from a Blind Man and His Dogs about overcoming, well, I want to say it right, being brave, overcoming adversity, and moving forward in faith. So Live Like a Guide Dog, Stories from a Blind Man and His Dogs about about being brave, overcoming diversity, and moving forward in faith. And I'll send you a link that you can put up 
uh, the publisher has put up a link about pre-ordering the book. And I hope people will do that because we want to show people that there's a lot of interest in it. But the book will help anyone who reads it to learn to understand that you literally can control fear. I'm not going to say you won't be afraid. That's just not true. But what you can learn to do is to control it and use it as a powerful tool so that when something happens, like if you were to be confronted by something like the World Trade Center, you don't need to let the fear overwhelm you. I hear mm -hmm. people say all the time, oh, I could never do what you did in the World Trade Center, or um, oh gosh, I could never do the things that you do. Um, you know, there's just no way I could do it with my eyes closed. Sure you could if you had to. And the fact is that you can learn to do that. You can learn to stay calm in unexpected situations. And so Live Like a Guide Dog will teach people how to do that. We use stories of the eight guide dogs that I've had, plus my wife's service dog, Fantasia, to uh, provide examples where you can learn various lessons about not being afraid or how to control fear. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you very much. And, and also, people can also go out and check out your uh, first book, which was a New York Times bestseller, Thunder Dog, which Thunder sold Dog, two and right. a half million copies, right? Two and a half million copies that book sold. So they can go and check that out as well. So, Mike, thank you so and it, much. And it is still available. It, uh, you know, people can buy Thunder Dog wherever books are sold in audio format, like from Audible and so on. Um, they can buy the print copy, large print copy, and it's available in a number of languages as well. Amazing. Mike, thank you so much for being a guest. We'll put all of those links in the show notes. If people want to go and check that out, they can do. And uh, I, I wish you all the best with your endeavors. And uh, for everybody that's been listening, until next time, make it happen. Thank you for listening to Make It Happen with Will Polston. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please feel free to share it with anybody that you think could benefit from it. And also make sure that you hit subscribe so that you get to get the new episodes as soon as they're released.